a dungeon crawler on the Mega 65. The code for what you see on the screen here fits on a single 80 by 25 line screen. In a previous video I explained how to create a dungeon crawler like this. Not surprisingly, the code was much longer. It went over several pages. In this video I will show you what I did to make it fit into one screen. Why would you do that? Because there was a coding competition going on, the screen full of basic competition 2025 for the Mega 65. With that being said, let's crunch some basic code. And welcome to this episode of the 8-bit theory. Before we dive into the code, I would like to show you what this game engine can actually do. At the beginning we see an initial view of where we are. On top of the screen we have a compass that tells us which direction we are facing. We are facing north. The keys Q and E allow us to turn left and right. Below the first person view we see a message about which keys we can use. And we can walk forward and backward and we can strafe left and right. Now I'm facing north. When I strafe left, suddenly the compass changes to west. That's nothing you can easily recognize without me telling you. But here we actually have a spinner. That's a field that changes our facing direction when we walk on it. Some fields display a message just like the tile we started on. And here you see me walking south. Then we have the message feels weird. And when we turn around, the view has changed. We are only supposed to be able to turn right here but now we have a T crossing left and right, so we were teleported. And that's all we have, texts, spinners and teleports. Now let me tell you about the code. At first sight this looks like a big mess, so let me start by giving you a little bit of structure. One block is about the data that's required. Then we have functions and variable declarations. After that comes the actual game loop. Here we start with processing the player's input. Based on that, we calculate which dungeon walls are visible and need to be drawn. After that, we have the actual dungeon wall drawing routines and we output the text for the tile we are standing on currently, if there is one to display. And that's it already. Go to 4 goes back to the beginning of the game loop, which is waiting for user input. Now let me walk you through these sections in more detail. Starting in line 0, we have map data. The variable e holds the memory position of the first value after the RAM statement. We can see this in the monitor. Basic programs start at hex 2000. We can see the three ones at the end of the line and the last byte of that is 2000f. So it starts at 2000d and 2000d that's 8205 decimal. In the original code, the map data was stored in regular data statements. While a different map is shown here, you can see that it only contains ones and zeros. Based on that idea, I started to just put ones and zeros into that RAM line. And instead of using read and an array to make the values accessible, I defined the function p, which takes the same value as a parameter that you would use to access data in an array. The bank zero statement in line 2 is very important for this, so we're not accidentally accessing data in the wrong bank, like from basic ROM or so. As you can see, this RAM line contains more than just ones and zeros, and that's because I wanted to have more variety than just walls or walkable tiles, so we now have also spinners, teleports and tiles that display text. Line 1, another RAM line, contains the screen coordinates for the wall elements to draw. How drawing exactly works is explained in my previous video. I will add a link to that here. Just real quick, we have 19 different wall elements that we can use to construct the first person view into the dungeon. We use the box command for drawing the wall elements and for each of these we need four x y coordinate pairs to connect four points on the screen. So eight values in this line refer to one wall element each. To save even more screen space the coordinates here are divided by 12. So 1 1 will really be drawn to 12 12. As you can imagine it's not easy to type in this data without errors. That's why I created a small tool that just outputs that data to a RAM line. The Mega65's import and merge statements came in really handy for this. 
In this case, I wasn't able to just use the data here on the fly as with the first REM line. So there is a preparation step to be able to use this data more conveniently. In line two, we have the dim command for the array that will contain this data. And in line three, we have the for loop that fills the array. We use the same function p as for the map data, but we will add 150 to it. That gives the index of each value in the second REM line. The somewhat complex looking formula is doing nothing more than just stretching the coordinates, but only one of the dimensions is stretched. And that's what that mod command is doing, differentiating between even and odd lines. Looking at the box command, we see that it's easier to have this data in a two-dimensional array. The first dimension is the wall element ID. The second dimension is the actual parameter, 0 to 7. As the final part of program data, we have the data statements that are distributed all over the code. And that's actually a great thing. Data statements are not executed at runtime whenever the program execution reaches their location. They are actually ignored. But the read statement just browses through all of the code and reads one value after the other. It keeps a dedicated pointer for that. That means we can just put data statements at the end of lines when the rest of line would be dead, like after return statements and so on. The data that's contained here is movement offsets and the 2D, 3D transformation data. Movement offsets describe how to change the position index in the map matrix depending on the direction we are facing. These values are stored in the P array and the value 12 is subtracted. That's because we would have negative values in the data statements, which would take up more screen space otherwise. Also, please note that the first data statement just starts with a comma as the first value. And that's because read interprets empty values as zero. So the first value is actually minus 12 and the rest of the movement offsets is plus 12, plus one, minus one, plus 12, minus 12, minus 1, plus 1. The 2D, 3D transformation data is also something you should watch the previous video for. This data is stored in the V array. And here again, 37 is subtracted from each value, again, to save us from negative values in the data statements where the sign would eat up too much screen space. By the way, some of the tricks I use here can be found in the book for basic two one-liners. Um, that book really focuses on basic one-liners and the tricks you can use to keep your code as short as possible. The title is derived from the regular basic for loop. And I'm happy to say that I was able to support the author with some proofreading and so on. Just so you know that I'm biased, but this is not a paid ad. The block after the REM lines contains declarations for functions, variables, and arrays. We covered most of them already, and I will cover the rest of them as we come across them being used. Context is always good. The last statement of that block is go to 5. This is relevant because it jumps into the part of the game loop that prepares the 3D first person view. We do that because the game loop waits for a key press before anything happens but we want the initial view to be shown without pressing a key. As a result of that, the game loop itself is not implemented as a loop, but we use go to 4 to jump back to the beginning of the loop. While this is not beneficial to execution speed, the 40 MHz allow us to waste this potential. And with that, we enter the game loop. After getting the key press, we calculate whether we are facing a new direction Turning left and right happens through the keys Q and E, and the variable F contains the direction we are facing. 0 is for north, then 1 for east, 2 for south, and 3 for west, so plus 1 for each direction. After 3 comes 0 when turning right, when turning left, after 0 comes 3. We could do that through an extensive if block, or we can just use a little function for that. The mod statement in BASIC 65 comes in really handy. It provides us with the result of a division. So for all regular values between 0 and 3, dividing them by 4 equals the same value. But 3 plus 1 is 4, which is what we do when we are facing west and turning right. 
and 4 divided by 4 results in a remainder of 0, which is exactly the value we want. Now 0 minus 1 results in minus 1, and minus 1 divided by 4 has a remainder of minus 1. That's what happens when we are facing north and turn left. To not run into negative values like this, we just add 4 to all the values. So the function that we are having here really doesn't work with the values 0 to 3, but 4 to 7. And we just do this every time a key is pressed. If input is q, i equals 81 results in minus 1. If input is e, i equals 69 equals uh, minus 1. Adding the absolute keyword makes this plus 1. So if one of those two keys is pressed, the function returns the correct new value for our facing direction. Next we check whether the player wants to strafe left or right. This time we check for the according keys. Strafing left or right changes our position on the map. And that's different depending on the direction we are facing. The same goes for walking forward and backward and for that we have that lookup table in the P array. Now, Instead of creating a dedicated lookup table for strafing, I discovered that the same table can be used if we are just assuming that the player is turning left. So facing east and strafing to the right is the same as facing north and walking forward, and this goes for all four directions. That's why we temporarily turn left to the target location calculation and then turn right again. Target location calculation means we have to check whether our new position on the map is walkable or not. If not, we hit a wall and we need to keep the old position. Line 12 takes care of this. We keep our current position in a temporary variable. Then we add the value from the P array to our current position, based on which direction we are facing and whether we are going forward or backward. Q keeps track of our new position. Now the variable L can take two different values. For one, it takes the previous position value T if Q equals one, which tells us that we hit a wall. If Q equals two, it multiplies its value by 44. And that's because we use two to describe a teleport field. So L can be the previous position's negative value or minus 44. If L is lower than zero, that's the teleport case, P, our new position, becomes L. If L equals zero, that means we neither hit a wall nor a teleport field, P takes its own negative value. Negative, because the L equals zero is represented by a minus one if it's true and we need to have a position value, a positive position value as the result. The 44 comes from our target position in case of a teleport, so if we wanted to teleport to a different position, this would be the place to change it. So this single line checks whether the target tile is free, occupied or a teleport. Now we have the new position stored in P and go back to the input handling. You see the f equals function f q equals 3 here? That means if q equals 3 and q still holds the value of the map tile of our new position, we update our facing direction with the value of minus 1. So whatever direction we are facing, this will turn us to the left whenever we come to a tile with the value 3. And that's our spinner. Finally, we check for forward or backward keys and go to position calculation in line 12 again. Not exactly again, because this is the else branch, we either do it when strafing or when moving backward or forward. And here again, we do the spinner. So we could easily make the spinner behave differently, depending on whether we walked on it forward or backward, or whether we strafed on it sideways. And with that, the program flow naturally merges into line 5, which calculates the first person view, and that's also the target line we jumped into at the end of line 3. Calculating our first person perspective follows a well defined path. We start with the tiles immediately in front of us, and whenever we hit a wall, we know that we do not have to draw specific tiles behind that one. 
Now the list of elements to check used to be a regular array in the regular code and that took up quite some space. For this challenge it has been converted into a string. Instead of an array with 1, 3 and 5 we have the string a, c and h. And line 10 extracts each letter into variable c by using the asc function and subtracting 64 from the ASCII value of that letter. This way a becomes 1, c becomes 3 and h becomes 5 again. Other than that, preparing the render list for the first person view is not different to the regular code. Now lines 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 just walk through the tree of wall elements and add those to an array that should be drawn. The last return statement brings us back to line 5 where we bump right into the go to 13 statement which brings us to the rendering part of the party. Here in line 13 we clear the screen and write the direction we are facing on top of the screen. These Petsky characters are usually for North, East, South and West, N-E-S-W. For that we just do a midstring and the index is the value of the F variable plus 1 which holds our facing direction. So facing North is 0, plus 1 is 1 and the first character in that string is N. Next we just render the visible wall elements, this is no different from the regular code. After that we have a character command again and it contains a long string containing all the messages that can be shown below the first person view. And this works mainly the same way as writing the facing direction. The strategy is that each message is 12 characters long. The nice thing about the midstring function is that it just returns an empty string if the index given is larger than the length of the string. So the formula we are using here only returns valid multiples of 12 when we hit a tile with the according value. A tile's value is returned by function p and parameter p holds our current position. So that's the value of the tile. I have this trick from the 10-liner cave adventure on the CX81 by Aina Saukas. 8 p Intel ported this to the VIC-20, which is where I was made aware of it. You will find the link in the description below. And that's it. Go to 4 finally jumps to the beginning of the game loop, waiting for the player's input again. I really enjoyed creating this. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it into a real game with real goals to reach. Although it's so much fun discovering new bits and pieces that can be optimized, I had to force myself to stop because I also wanted to join another game jam, the Dungeon Crawler Game Jam 2025. A special thanks goes to the organizers of the Screenful competition, Dan from the Mega65 project and Seha of Dr. Wuro Industries. It was a real welcome change to the well-established one or ten liner competitions. Also make sure to check out all the other submissions, I was amazed by the quality of them. Also be sure to check out the Mega65 intro disc number 4, it conveniently contains all these submissions in one spot. The next video will be about my contribution to the Dungeon Crawler Jam. I chose the C128 with the VDC chip as my platform of choice, so that video will be very VDC heavy again. Make sure to not miss that by subscribing to the bell if you want. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Thanks for watching. See you next time here at the 8-bit theory. Obsolete but not useless.